Hey guys, it's Kendra. And this is Jessica. And you're listening to Lucid Lab. Lab. It's Sunday. We're tired. We had a long night last night. Yeah. We were out later than we're usually. And then we both came home and got on TikTok for like an hour. <laughs> I know. I just looked at my sleep or whatever and I didn't go to bed till 1.30 last night. Yeah. And I'm usually a 10.30 to 11 kind of girl. I wish I could be that. I have to switch that soon, though, because school's starting again. I can't believe school is already starting again. I know. It went by so fast. What the hell? Where's our summer? It just started, and it's going to be August. I know. I mean, it is August when you guys are listening to this episode. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we went out to a concert last night, Mm -hmm. and it was outdoors. And anytime you're at a concert outdoors in Colorado, there's a chance you're going to have a rain delay. And I have been to, I think this was my fourth concert this summer, and every single one I've been (laughs) delayed. And we were driving there and Jessica's like, what did you say? Oh, I jinxed us because I was like, even if it rains, it's only going to last 20 minutes here in Colorado. And I didn't do that. It was like a 45 minute rain (laughs) with lightning and thunder. And then we went back out and the music started playing and then it rained again on us in the middle of the show. So it was fun. It was fun to get out. It was a huge difference compared to what it was like when we first got there. It was boiling hot with the sun directly on us. Mm -hmm. I was about to die yeah i don't know how anybody stands out there i feel for the people who work those events who have yeah to they just have to be out there sit in the sun that's insane Hopefully they have those little misters <laughs> or yeah. little personal fans so we're starting a two-parter today yep so this is the two-parter that i needed to hold off on so you guys wouldn't have a month of two-parters <laughs> It's a horrible one, but it is quite the story. Okay. I came upon just this paragraph snippet of this story a long time ago, again, in the beginning. So I'm going back to some stuff that's been on my list for like a a really long time. I didn't really know what it was about. And I decided to see if there were any books on this. And there was one. And it's amazing. It's called If You Tell by Greg Olson. It's probably one of the best true crime books that I've read. Hmm. And that might have already given it away if you read true crime or knew of this story. But it never ceases to amaze me that after everything we have researched, there are still individuals that have the ability to shock me. (laughs) Right. This is another house of horrors. Okay. Different from Ariel Castro. Different from Fred and Rose West. How many house of horrors are there, damn it? (laughs) A million, sadly. Too many. <laughs> and some we don't even know about yet. Right. This is the story of Shelley Notek. And I know nothing about this. Okay. So she's the villain in this story. There's another person as well, but I'll argue that that wouldn't have been the case, more than likely, if Shelley didn't turn this person into that. Oh, okay. So definitely buckle up. If you have not heard this story, because it's pure madness and not the good kind, but the kind we like on <laughs> yeah. this podcast. Lots of details. Lots of details. Before we get to Shelley, let's talk about her parents. This is a multi-generational story that starts off in Battleground, Washington, which is 11 miles northeast of Vancouver, Washington, and 32 miles south of Mount St. Helens. Okay. It is a small condensed mountain town of just under 22,000 people. And as it was then as it is today... The bowling alley is the place to go. (laughs) Sounds like small town anywhere. Now, they have golf and a skate park, but definitely small town vibes. It is considered a safe place to live, but as we know, evil is often hiding inside someone's home. Shelley's father, Lester Ralph Watson, he went by Les, was a big shot in his younger years. The talk of the town. He was 6'2", handsome, and a track and football star in high school. He was known for his charm, but also for being a bit of a liar. Okay. After high school, his family was well known because they owned several businesses in the town. Along with his mother, Les owned nursing homes and the bowling alley, which is called the Tiger Bowl. Mm, I'm not sure who owns it now, but it's still open if you go to the area. (laughs) I went on their website. I was like, oh, interesting. (laughs) I'm not sure when and how they met, but Les married Shannon Lee Todd, and together they had three children. Shelley was born Michelle Watson on April 15th, 1954. Charles Nolan Watson, who went by Chuck, was born in 1957. And Paul Todd Watson was born in 1959. She is the oldest. She is. And here enters Laura Stallings. I believe her real name is Laura, but was changed to Laura for the book. Okay. I guess as a pseudonym. So I'll follow suit and call her Laura for the remainder of this episode. 
Laura was working at the Tiger Bowl in 1958 when she met Les. Mm -hmm. She was 18 years old. She had just graduated from Fort Vancouver High School. She had long, blonde, curly hair and blue eyes. She was saving up for college and had no idea what she was about to get herself into. Uh Uh-oh. She started dating Les, thinking he was only four years older than her because... That's what he told her. Oh, because he's a liar. It wasn't until just before or after they got married that she found out that he was actually 10 years older than her. Things went quick for them, and she was naive at the time. She thought she won the jackpot with him. He's young. He already has a lot going on for him. She did know that he had children, but that they were living in California with their mother. Oh, okay. They married in a small civil ceremony in early 1960. Only Laura's family was there, even though they didn't want her to marry him. Okay. And the reality of what she married into was soon to smack her in the face because there was something else that Les forgot to mention. Okay. The day after she got married to Les, she gets a phone call in the morning. This is the day after. It was Sharon, his first wife. Okay. She said annoyingly with urgency, when are you coming to get these damn kids? Okay. What Les failed to mention was that he promised to take the kids from Sharon if he were to ever get remarried. Wow. So neither parent wanted the kids, really. Well, I what think they were young like. and staying with her at the time kind of thing. What mom is like, come get the kid. Like, that seems Yeah, she's not all there. To me. We'll talk about her a little bit. Okay. But that's something that you kind of need to discuss with the woman that, that you're, you're going to marry. And she's young. She's young but he knew how to manipulate the situation he said that sharon was a depressed alcoholic and the kids would be better off with them so laura who was young you know she was just this optimistic girl Mm -hmm. she agreed yeah from the beginning this girl has a good heart and you'll see it throughout the rest of the episode and she's in love with less and yeah and he's a liar. He's 10 years older than her. <laughs> does she know that yet? Yeah, she does okay, know she that now. she already knows he's 10 years older. She knows that now. I don't so know. So that makes him like 28 years old, maybe 29 or 30 by the time they yes. get married. Yep. They didn't get all three kids at first. Shelly was six at the time and Chuck was three. Paul was still an infant. So Sharon kept him for the time being. Remember, Paul was born in 1959. So that does mean that Les started dating Laura when Sharon was pregnant with Paul. Mm. But she had moved pregnant they were to already California. Yeah. So something happened where the relationship ended and she ended up there pregnant okay. and divorced. And a little side note here, I was trying to look up more information on Les, Sharon and the kids during this time. And I came upon a family search website. And it lists Lester and Sharon, but Shelly and Laura and Les's other children, they're not listed at all. Okay. I just found it to be really interesting because Sharon was just his wife in the beginning. Mm, And they didn't stay together. But Shelly's like, even on this random website, Shelly's like not listed as one of his kids. (laughs) It's weird. But if I was him, I would probably contact a website and have her removed as well. (laughs) So (laughs) maybe that's what happened. Sharon herself came from a dysfunctional family. She was an only child, and she watched her mother marry countless men, Mm. like seven times. Yeah, that's a lot for a kid. We don't know what life was like for these kids up until the time they moved in with Les and Laura. Okay. There were rumors amongst family members that Sharon got caught up in a dangerous lifestyle, and she was working as a sex worker. Yeah, that's not good for kids. So I'm assuming life was not pretty for the kids. There may have been abuse, abuse towards them, abuse towards her that they witnessed, And considering that she couldn't wait to get rid of them, I'm sure that there was neglect. Uh, Yeah. Overall, right off the bat, the whole thing is just toxic. sad. Mm -hmm. And now these kids are being shipped off to live with someone else with a woman that they don't know. They've never met. But they also didn't miss their mother because they would end up having no contact with her ever again. Wow. She never asked about them once. She never reached out once and vice versa. They didn't ask about their mother. Okay. Not everyone's fit to be a parent. Yep. But that gives those kids trauma. Like when your mom. I think they were traumatized right out the womb. Mm -hmm. She just wasn't there. She didn't have that maternal instinct. And for all we know, Les married her really young too and it was just a lot of trauma. Like she wasn't ready she didn't want to have kids and yeah he got her pregnant yep. yeah who knows when Shelly and Chuck got there Laura noticed something was off immediately Chuck did not speak at all Shelly spoke for him and Chuck was always clinging to her Aww. so there's definitely some trauma there Laura however described it in a way that made it seem like Chuck wasn't clinging to Shelly for safety but rather that Shelly controlled him okay after finding her footing in the home Shelly became the stepdaughter from hell Mm. I mean she's still a child right now she's six she experienced some crap 
So I'm going to walk on eggshells for just a minute. (laughs) Yeah, you can't. But she definitely starts to lash out in ways that you only see in like movies with diabolical evil children that are just super set on destroying everything. Mm, Okay. Every single day and every single opportunity she had, she would tell Laura that she hated her. Ouch. I don't want to wait on painting the story of Laura. I'll just get it out of the way so you have a better picture overall here. Laura's a really good person. Okay. She did everything she could to help raise these kids and give them a good life. And she will be in the story until the end. So she's a good woman. She's not evil stepmom. Yeah. Whatsoever. She just got thrust into this like horrible situation. Yes. But no matter what she did, Shelly made it her mission to be as difficult as possible. Shelly refused to do anything she was told to do. And when she didn't get her way, she threw literal fits for a long time, screaming on the floor, literal fits. Tantrums, yeah. Laura was trying to keep things together, but Les constantly just gave in. He never punished Shelly, which I get. Like, it's if easier you, if not If you to. haven't been there and now yeah. she's living with you and you know that this is a traumatic situation, it would be hard to punish a child. Yeah. I get that. But she became his little princess. Mm. Everyone else in the house was fine. When she wasn't home, it was almost serene for everyone. The one thing that I do see missing at this point in her younger childhood is probably some therapy. Yeah, to help her process whatever she Mm -hmm. experienced. I think she would have greatly benefited from it. But that's back in a time when therapy wasn't even thought of. It's true. With Les being sort of removed... He was sort of an absent father, and that's just because he worked a lot. He owned a lot of businesses. He wasn't home a lot. Right. So Laura was left to deal with the day in and day out drama. Yeah. Which she really didn't complain about, despite the difficulties. Yeah. But there was sort of a final straw that made Shelley just a hopeless cause. Hmm. In the spring of 1967, Battleground Police got a call. Sharon was dead. A police officer showed up to the Watson house asking for someone to go down to California to identify her body and pick up Paul, who's the youngest son. Yeah, now he's what, like six or seven probably? Yes. I believe he's now six. Okay. She was murdered in a seedy hotel room. Oh. She had been beaten to death by her druggy boyfriend. Mm. Initially, Les did not want to have his last son. I guess he had had contact with him and he was just a really difficult kid. Oh, wow. But Laura insisted. Well, yeah. (laughs) She's like, this is their brother. Like, we have to take him. Can't leave that kid hanging out there. And she's like, he can't go into the system. No. Oh, my gosh. So they went and got him and they had Sharon cremated. And this is sad. Her family refused to take the ashes and there was no memorial service for her. Wow. When Shelly was told, she showed no emotion. She had no reaction. This was six, seven years later and she had not had contact with her mother the entire time. Yeah. But even with that, Laura did find her lack of reaction to be strange for any child to find out that their mother had died. And they're just like, okay. It's like she didn't even hear it. Mm -hmm. Even if the reaction would have been relief, like she would have understood that, but no reaction whatsoever was a precursor to what Shelly would be like later in life. Yeah. But it was after this that Shelly took everything up a notch. So Mm -hmm. Shelly is now 13. I mean, that's a bad age anyway. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Chuck is 10 and their brother Paul, who they haven't seen in years, is six and is coming to live with them. Paul was a menace right away. Really, it was like he had been raised by a pack of wolves and didn't know how to act like a human being. They probably just ignored him all the time. Probably. He was probably alone for hours on end. I bet. He had no social skills. He lacked impulse control. Who knows what he experienced all those years. Yeah. When Sharon died, they had been homeless for some time, too. Oh, wow. He didn't even know how to sit down. Like, he was just very... Hyperactive. Like Tarzan, taken from the forest, you know, just all over the place. He would climb all over the countertops looking for food. Like he would open cabinets and just toss everything out onto the floor looking for something that he wanted. He was like a feral child. Exactly. And the wild kid carried a switchblade around with him everywhere. So it scared Laura because she couldn't get that taken away from him. Well, probably not. God knows what that kid experienced. Mm -hmm. If he was living on the streets, he probably needed it for protection against creepy people. So now here's Laura with three very different children. Mm -hmm. All not hers, but two of which she had been trying to raise for some time. Shelly was a handful. And now there is this wild child, (laughs) wild monkey boy (laughs) that she couldn't rein in. 
Laura doesn't talk about him negatively, though. Just that he was wild when she first got him. <laughs> yeah. Because she knows he's just a kid. Right. Can't help his circumstances. And then her husband is off working all the time. So it's yep. really all on her to like it is. figure this out, which really, really sucks for her. And even all these years later, Chuck is still silent. He probably saw something really traumatic. Probably. I don't even want to imagine. She said at this point he would like say a few words from time to time, but it was only ever what Shelly would tell him to say. So there was this control. I feel bad for Chuck. Like you said, like probably saw something really, really bad. He was a quiet boy. He was a loner. And a neighbor once said that she witnessed him standing in an open window, like staring out of the house. And he was just crying and holding himself. Oh, my God. Yeah. Something deep in there that he's repressing. But it wasn't from lack of trying to make the kids' lives as good as possible. At some point, either before Paul got there or after, Les and Lara did have two more kids. Oh, wow. A daughter and a son. I don't know their names. I don't know when they were born. But on the weekends, as one big family, they always took the kids somewhere fun. Oh, that's cool. The two of them did really like to focus on family time. So you start to like Les a little bit more. He does become a bit of a family man, but he's yeah, still a little detached at the same time. I think so. They spent summer months on the coast boating and swimming, and in the winter, they all went skiing. Yeah, so they had a good upbringing. Mm -hmm. But it became more clear as time went on that their life would have been great if it was not for Shelly. <laughs> oh, <laughs> she's just like the dark cloud. <laughs> yeah. Shelly was still refusing to do anything asked of her. She threw her fits. She started fights. She was constantly lying. She would blame everything on her siblings. If she didn't want to do her homework, she would claim that she did do it, but that her brothers destroyed it. She, again, would often refuse to go to school. Laura tried appeasing Shelly's temperament to make going to school easier for her by laying out her clothes the night before, putting breakfast on the table, just to make it easy for her to get herself together in the morning. Mm -hmm. She tried, but Shelly still refused. And when she would go, sometimes she would immediately change out of the new clothes that Laura had bought her just so that she didn't have to wear these new clothes. Laura got a call from the gas station down the road that was on the way to school. Mm -hmm. Shelly had been stopping in there in the mornings and changing her clothes. Uh, into something inappropriate? <laughs> I think just not wanting to wear whatever Laura thought was nice okay. for her. They said they found an entire pile of hidden clothes in the bathroom. That's money, girl. And Laura went in there and it was all new dresses that she had bought for her. Yeah. And when Laura bought her gifts, Shelly didn't like them. It was just as if nothing was ever good enough. Yeah, she just never liked her. Everything was a fight. Yeah. But she didn't like her own mom either. I just don't think she liked anybody. Yeah. She started acting out more towards her siblings, too. She didn't like any attention going to them instead of her. No. Oh, so she's full on. Mm -hmm. We always end up with narcissists on here. She's sadistic, too. Yeah. She would put chunks of broken glass in their shoes. Oh, my God. On more than one occasion. She started a couple of house fires. Mm. She would manipulate and terrify them. She would break things around the house. And she had an evil way about her with other things. She would pretend to care about something and then just destroy it afterwards. Okay. For instance, she would offer to help with dishes. Mm -hmm. And then she would just take it all and throw all of the pots and pans and plates and utensils in the garbage outside. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> She's just a fucked up kid. I, like, I don't know. We don't understand how that mind works. That's yeah, why I'm something. saying she reminds me of those movies of those evil kids yeah. who like they just want to cause chaos where you're like nobody really exists like that and and then there's always like one parent like you're losing your mind she's fine yeah and that was the dad because mm -hmm. she was his little princess exactly mm -hmm. at one point Shelly made it known that she wanted to start babysitting that sounds horrible not for the kids siblings <laughs> yeah but other children she claimed that she loved children but when Lara set this up for her, thinking, OK, well, you know, maybe this it's is a little a job. Thing. Yeah. The parents of the kids that she was watching would come home to find the kids in the same clothes, not asleep, sometimes locked in their rooms, sometimes oh, barricaded. So she wasn't doing anything. She's just like, <laughs> I want the money. I don't want to actually spend time with the kids. And I think what she wants more than anything is control. So yes, Shelly had a difficult life in the beginning, but since she was six, everyone doted on her. So where this behavior is coming from like later on, we do have an answer to that. And that's her grandmother, who was her role model. 
and this is Grandma Anna. Okay. Her mom's mom? It's I'm actually guessing. her dad's mom. Oh, okay. So we know where her behavior sort of came from when she was young, but it was worsened by her relationship with her dad's mother who once that started to okay. form. So Grandma Dearest. <laughs> yes. So Les's parents were George and Anna. Anna ran the show. And if it wasn't for Anna, I do think it's possible that Shelly might have outgrown this Her little phase. thing. Okay. Because Anna was an evil woman. Mm. They owned those nursing homes, which is scary. Oh, and no. Anna was horrible to her staff. Diabolical. She was a large, formidable woman, and people were scared of her. Okay. People knew when she was coming because her left foot kind of dragged on the floor. Okay. It would scrape along the ground. It's like a horror movie right there. It was scary. It's like Krampus <laughs> and his chains. <laughs> You're like, here's, here's Anna coming. <laughs> yeah. Laura was scared of her, too. She had to brace herself for any interactions that might come up with her. Can you imagine? <laughs> That's your mother-in-law? Yeah. And like Shelly, or Shelly like her, she was always right. Mm. No matter what, no one dared to challenge her. I love those kind of people. Les's father, poor George, was missing a backbone, which is not an insult. You shouldn't have to have one when you're married. No, it's supposed to be a partnership. Exactly. But, yeah. but he was completely unlike Anna. He was a kind, sweet, endearing That's how it always man. is, right? Yeah. And Anna abused him. Mm -hmm. He was much smaller than her. <laughs> And he wow. did everything she told him to do. And she made him sleep in an eight by eight shed outside of the house for more than 20 years. Oh, my God. <laughs> he was her pet. Yep. He wasn't her husband. So when we get into Shelly, you'll see how she directly took some cues from Grandma Anna. Yeah, Grandma needs to be looked at. She's probably got some skeletons buried somewhere, too. Anna was so horrible to her staff. She never called them by name. She referred to them as her retards. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. Laura recalls them being more like slaves. Yeah. Even though they worked for the nursing home, she would make them clean her home. And regardless of what they were doing, just to be cruel, she would stop them and make one of them wash her feet. What? The or do fuck? her hair. This woman is cuckoo cocoa puffs, whatever. And I don't know how she got away with this, but if she was ever upset with them for anything, no matter how small it was, she would physically abuse them, her staff. She would punch and kick them. She would pull their hair. She even held their heads in toilet bowls while repeatedly flushing it. Why did these people leave? Why would you work for her? It's a control thing. They need the money. I don't know who it was. Yeah. I don't know how many people she had on staff. Right. I don't know. Anna was sadistic with everyone except one person. Her granddaughter. Shelly. See, Shelly spent a lot of her time with her grandmother. Her school was close to the nursing home. And instead of taking the bus home, Shelly would go spend time with her and witnessed how she treated people. Dangerous. Yeah. Great role model. Mm -hmm. Whenever this would happen, Laura would call looking for Shelly and would be scolded by Anna by some sob story from Shelly that she was neglected. Oh. Which was not the so case. she's playing grandma against mm -hmm. stepmom. As a teenager, Shelly had long, beautiful red hair. Mm -hmm. One time, Laura picked her up and it was all cut off. Oh. And this is going to come back later, too. It was chopped to oblivion. Anna said she did it because Shelly's hair was rarely brushed, so she cut it. Oh, my gosh. Laura couldn't force Shelly to take care of herself as a teenager. Right. And she would fight with Laura if she tried to brush her hair for her, you know? Mm -hmm. She did. She tried every single day brushing Shelly's hair. And sometimes, you know, she would get away with being able to do it, but <laughs> but it was constant stuff like this. Laura was never doing anything right. Yeah. And I just think of, like, my daughter. I brush her hair constantly throughout the day. And she still looks like a wild child at certain yes, times. Yes, like I'm 15, sure. 20 minutes yes. later. Her, her hair is insane. I remember that with my kids, too. It's like, you can't keep it. Like, they go outside and do all their little flips and stuff. And then their hair's like, it's just everywhere. Or they roll around on the ground. Who knows what they do? Or they're just like, you know, in their room or in the living room. And they're, for some reason, just doing a headstand while yes. they're doing other things. Like, you can't control a kid's hair. Or they're playing with slime and their long hair gets in it. <laughs> like, <laughs> shit. Gum. So anyway, Shelly and Anna became inseparable. Two peas in a pod. Yeah. Making people miserable was their source of happiness. Yeah. Shelly learned a lot from her grandmother, but somehow became a hundred times worse. Ugh. So Shelly is now 14. She's a month away from being 15 years old. And she does something that is just screaming for attention and therapy. 
In March of 1969, Shelly didn't show up home from school. Okay. She wasn't with her grandmother, so Laura waited a little bit before calling the school to see if they had any information. Shelly was not at school, but she was at the juvenile detention center in Vancouver. Okay. She didn't know what happened yet, so she called Les and they drove there. They thought Shelly got into trouble for stealing or something because she's been in trouble for that kind of stuff before. But when they got there, it was something else entirely. Shelly had told the school counselor that her father was sexually oh, abusing God. her, specifically raping her. Okay. They were both shocked, mm -hmm. understandably. And this is when I get frustrated because we always say believe girls and women when they say they've been abused. But every now and then there's one fucked up girl out there making it hard for us to be believed. I know. And it's this is what they will use when they're trying to get these young boys off. We right. know that they have sexually assaulted women and then their prosecutors can use cases like this. Exactly. And Laura knew that this wasn't happening. Yeah. Shelley was taken for a physical examination at St. Johnson's Hospital in Vancouver. Les and Laura went home while Shelley was there. They actually wouldn't let them see her because, you know, yeah. they're doing their due they're diligence. Mm -hmm. If this is true abuse, that they're not going to let her back with her abuser. Right. It was under investigation. Laura went into Shelley's room at the house. Not really sure what she was looking for, but in the mess, she decided to check the spot we all know of, but still use, you know, that space between the mattress. Oh, okay. <laughs> Everybody uses that anyway. Mm -hmm. She found a magazine called True Confessions. Okay. And it was folded open to an article with the title, I was raped at 15 by my dad. Okay. And that's her story. They were both beside themselves. Les was heartbroken. Well, yeah. That's that like, she would make such an accusation. Such a betrayal. And and he could be looked at as a exactly. sex offender for the rest of his life. But this was the first time he actually stopped and he's like, crap, there's something wrong with my daughter. Yeah. And he started to see what Laura had seen all this time. Right. Shelly's manipulative and mm -hmm. she's kind of evil. Right. After the examination at the hospital, it was determined that Shelly was not being sexually abused. Good. She was completely intact. So she's virgin. No cherry popped. Mm -hmm. The doctor even used the wording, she's never even been touched. Yeah. She was released to Les and Lara under the condition that she receives counseling. So they tried. Good. They had her see a psychologist. They did family sessions. But Shelly, she just didn't take to it, like, at all. And the biggest issue was Shelly didn't think she needed help. She didn't see anything wrong in anything that she had ever done. Okay. And it's hard to help those people. Yeah, she's obviously got something going on psychologically. Yeah. After this, Laura and Les were done dealing with her antics. They had other children to worry about, and it was clear that Shelly was not going to change her ways. Les was now president of the Chamber of Commerce. In addition to the other businesses he owns, he can't have his crazy daughter throwing around accusations like no, this. No. They tried to go back to normal for a moment, but even her own high school refused to take her back after what she did. Mm. Because what she did was serious. Yes. And they all had a serious response to it, all for it just to be one of Shelley's lies. Yeah. But she needed to be in school and no one would take her. So what do they do with her? They tried paid for boarding schools. Even they wouldn't take her. Oh, God. It wasn't just this incident on her school record holding things up. She hadn't been a pleasant student for most of her life. Mm -hmm. Finally, Laura found somewhere that she could go. It was St. Mary of the Valley in Beaverton, Oregon, which was 40 miles away. Okay. Unfortunately, in order for this to happen, Laura did have to fib a little bit about what Shelly had done. No. Because honesty wasn't working. <laughs> not going to get her anywhere. <laughs> but she did feel like it would be the best thing for her. Maybe some... No BS nuns would whip her into shape. Maybe. Smack her with some rulers. But just after a few weeks of her being there, even the nuns were starting to have enough of her. Oh. And they asked Les and Laura to start picking her up on the weekends. <laughs> I don't know what you do. Like, that's such a hopeless situation as the parents when your child is that bad. I know. And that's why sometimes you do hear of parents kicking their kids out of the house at young ages. Tough, yeah. Tough love. The family was doing way better with Shelly gone. I'm sure. <laughs> even her brothers, who had their own problems... Laura and Les started to notice that they were improving without Shelly being in the house. Yeah. But one year of Shelly at the school was more than the nuns were willing to deal with, and they did not accept her back the following year. Okay. And they had a list of reasons why. Oh, shit. Shelly would wake up others in the middle of the night screaming. She stole everything constantly. <laughs> Once she stole another girl's homework and destroyed it because she just didn't like her. And she did what she did with her brothers and she would put broken glass in other, other girls' shoes. shoes. Les and Laura tried to reason with the sisters saying that they would 
literally pay anything <laughs> to keep her there. And they still said, no way, Jose. They're like, we're good. We don't need the money. For that summer, they tried to put up with Shelly as best they could, but Les was no help. He still would not punish her. And Laura was at her wit's end. OK, dude, you know, she's a problem now. He or maybe he doesn't know how to punish is, her. Exactly. I don't think he knows how to. I don't know how you do. Honestly, when when they become teenagers, it becomes really hard to punish them. Yeah, I can speak from experience. Yeah. All they're going to do is rebel. They are just going to get even even more angry at you. You mm-hmm. take their phone away. You take their car away. Like, yeah, they yep. just they are little assholes from like they age are 12 to 18. But she's like a new version of it. Like she's a new layer. Oh, she's asshole. a whole new layer. <laughs> All they did was cater to her and Shelly was never satisfied. They tried putting Shelly with Laura's parents for a bit. That was horrible after just a couple of weeks because she told a neighbor that her grandfather was now molesting oh God. her. Go send her to Grandma Anne. I don't think. See, here's the thing. I don't think Anna even wanted her. No. Because Anna's her own level of bitch. Like, she yeah. doesn't want to put up with a child all the time. She might only love Shelly, but not that much. No, she's like, <laughs> I don't want to take care of her. Exactly. She's a little hellion. So her parents sent her back home and told them that they wanted nothing to do with Shelly nah. ever again. Yeah. I mean, think about it. If you're a grandfather and you're being accused of such a thing yeah that'd be hard and it's not his blood no and not at all and he's like this is dangerous and this yeah. girl you know i'm sure they were trying to everything and she it's was toxic. just throwing it back in their face and right putting glass in their shoes come on <laughs> <laughs> At some point, Shelly was having conversations with her Aunt Katie over the phone, who is Les' sister. She complained about how horrible her life was at home, and Kelly offered to let her come stay with them for the rest of the summer. Which she will regret. Even though they knew Shelly was saying horrible things about them, and that's why Kelly offered, they were happy. So yeah. they put her on a plane and let her go out there. And in the meantime, Les and Laura took the kids camping and to Disneyland, and they had a wonderful <laughs> summer without her. With no Shelly. With no issues. But then a few weeks later, they got a call from Aunt Katie. She's like, come get this demon spawn. Not yet. Okay. She said, she told me everything. Oh, no. That she was abused and all these bad things that were happening to poor Shelly. So Katie and her husband, Frank, advocated to keep her for the next school year with them in Murraysville, Pennsylvania. Okay. And And then it was like (laughs) Christmas morning. So Laura's Laura's like, like, (laughs) take her. She's yours. You want her, you got her. Again, even with knowing that the only reason this was happening was because Shelly was lying about absolutely everything and they were being seen as these bad parents, they didn't care. It was a (laughs) win for them to have an entire year of peace. They're like, our other kids can breathe. But ultimately, Katie and Frank would learn Shelly's true intentions. It was horrible for them. Oh, no. It ended up being more than a year. They really did try with Shelly, but the trouble with her ended up causing Katie and Frank to divorce. That's how bad it got. Oh, God. Shelly was black mold. Yeah. Everywhere she went. Everywhere she went. By 17, unbothered by the fact that she was literally breaking up families, Shelly met a boy, Randy. Okay. So Randy Rivardo met Shelly in the summer of 1971. Shelly was the knockout new girl that every guy wanted to get to know. They started dating and stayed together throughout the senior year at Franklin Regional High. And to Randy, it was really just a school fling. Mm -hmm. They didn't have like the same plans after high school. After graduation, Shelly moved back to Battleground, Washington, and Randy stayed in Pennsylvania. He was going to get a job because he wanted to save for college. That was his plan. In Washington, Shelly took a job at one of the nursing homes as an aide. Near the end of the summer, Randy hears from Shelly, and she said that she missed him. She wanted to be with him. She told him about a job offer from her dad as a maintenance man, that he could come to Washington, and Shelly and him could live rent-free in an apartment. Oh, okay. Knowing he was trying to save for college, she convinced him, you know, what's a better way? You don't have to pay Pay for for rent. Mm -hmm. He thought that they were done, but he did like her, so he agreed, and he moved to Washington. Okay. Almost immediately upon his arrival in Battleground, it was clear that Shelly's family had plans of their own. They wanted him to settle down with her and get married. <laughs> Do I please take this bitch <laughs> off our hands? Shelly at the time was just running around the town telling everyone how much she loved Randy. He felt pressured and he Uh, felt uneasy about it. He felt like they were all just a bit too eager to have her get married. He knew that there was something odd about it Mm -hmm. and he would soon find out why. But suddenly here he is. He just moved there. He's engaged and they were rushing the wedding. They even picked out the wedding party and they even picked out what he was wearing. He did invite his family to the wedding, but no one showed up. 
He later found out that Shelley never mailed them their invitations. Okay. <laughs> One day, he was just a kid with a job, trying to go to college, and now he's on the other coast, married and without anyone he knows. That's crazy. They were married in February of 1973. They were both 19 years old. Randy was taken by Shelley, and he thought that they were in love. Yeah. But after a short honeymoon, he started to see Shelley's true colors. No, she's crazy. Les had set them up rent-free like he said he would, but it was in a 40-foot trailer, and Shelley hated it. No. Les couldn't afford another house just to give to them, but Shelley complained and complained because she's too perfect of a princess to live in a trailer. <laughs> and that translated to work. Suddenly, she had menstrual cramping that made it impossible for her to work. Oh, convenient. All month. That's crazy. Because our periods last. All month. All month. <laughs> she would show up to work, complain, and leave early again, again and again. It got so bad that Les ended up firing his own daughter. Mm. Then she went to work for another family's nursing home. She was fired from there. Then Les would try and give her another chance and then fire her again. And she did this several times. She just was not okay with adulting. No. She was never okay. And this is when the Shelly we will come to know starts to emerge. Okay. Without a job, you'd think she would start to help out more around the house. But no, she never cooked. She never cleaned. She sat around watching TV all day and snacking. She expected everything to go her way always. And this included getting the new car she wanted. And even though Les fired her multiple times, when she asks for something, he gives it to her. Oh, my gosh. He's an enabler. She wanted a VW Beetle. Oh, I mean, everybody did back then. <laughs> I know, right? Saying, Daddy, that's the car I want. That's the car I have to have. Yeah. Les went to Vancouver to find her a car. Oh, my gosh. And he came back with a new pink Buick convertible. Oh, and then she's going to throw a fit. It's not what he I wanted, He thought it Daddy. was even better than the Beetle. And she would be happy. But no, she was pissed. It was a complete Veruca Salt moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not what I want. She complained that it was a horrible old maid's car and refused to take it. No one could understand like how she could be so ungrateful, what but she was. Bitch. This is who yeah. she was. That night, Shelly collapsed, literally. She had the scene lined out for her husband to find alcohol and sleeping pills. No. As if she attempted suicide. Because the car wasn't over she wanted. Over a fucking car. <laughs> Uh, yeah, a little dramatic. He tried to wake her and couldn't, so he rushed her to the hospital. And after pumping her stomach, all they found was two aspirin. I was going to say nothing. <laughs> so it was all a show, and it was a really good one. Later on, Randy did start attending college classes there, and one night he came home to a roughed-up Shelly mm. and a roughed-up trailer. Okay. Her face was bloody. She had scratches on her face. She claimed that a man broke in, attacked her, raped her, and ran out with one of his rifles. Okay. Randy called the sheriff and Les. They both rushed over. Les and Randy waited outside while the sheriff questioned her, and he came out after saying that her wounds were self-inflicted. Oh, God. There was no attacker. And before leaving, the sheriff said that he wouldn't file charges against her, but she needed to get some help. Yes. Shelley, of course, kept up the story and said, see, I'll prove it to you. I saw the attacker bury your rifle. I'll take you to it. Oh, God. And, <laughs> and then they and find a shovel did. and the dirt under her fingernails. Like <laughs> She took him over to this area, dug up the gun as if it proved that he did it. No one believed her. Yeah. Why the fuck would he bury a gun he didn't he just use took. that he just stole from you? <laughs> the story, you didn't think this through, girly. No. It was all a ruse to prove how dangerous it was to be living in a trailer. Oh, she needs a nice princess house. Yes, she does. She wanted somewhere more secure. She wanted a cute little house in town. Yes. So it was just constant chaos with her. She racked up bills all over town. And because she was Les's daughter, she pressured local businesses to give her whatever she wanted without paying. No. She racked up tabs everywhere until finally they would hunt down Randy and demand payment from him. And he would pay it, probably. He would pay it, even though he had a small salary and he would beg them, please don't let her get anything else. Yeah. And they would agree, but then they would cave to her later and it would happen again. Mm. In the summer of 1974, Shelley was pregnant. And that's the worst thing that could ever happen. <laughs> Laura thought it might calm her down, but she was secretly scared. Yeah. But his family, not knowing how crazy she was, were excited and they finally made a trip out to see them. Yeah. Shelley did not want them to come and threw a big fit about it. And he put his foot down. He's like, this is my, my baby mom and too. Dad. You're yeah. my wife. But when they came, Shelly stayed in her room the entire time. She did not come out once. 
Once they left, Shelly got rid of the gifts that they brought. What the fuck? Randy's sister accidentally left some clothes behind and Shelly offered to mail it back. But when she got the package inside the package, all of her clothes were cut up. Oh, my God. (laughs) Psycho bitch. Randy confronted her about it all and she would deny everything, blaming the post office for Uh. doing something weird to (laughs) your sister's clothes. And he was definitely reaching his limit with her, too. Yeah. In February of 1975, their baby Nikki was born. To have some help in the beginning, Shelly suggested that they go stay with her parents for a few days. And Laura, even though she had her opinions on Shelly, loved that baby. Mm -hmm. But days turned into weeks and then into months. And Randy demanded that they go back home. Yeah. Shelly just didn't want to take care of her own baby alone. That's not surprising. Laura worried about Nikki, too. So she drove to see Nikki every single day. Mm -hmm. She didn't trust (laughs) Shelly. Yes. Yeah. She's like psycho mom at Mm -hmm. home alone with this baby. Yeah. She didn't trust her. No. And like Grandma Anna did to Grandpa George, Shelly started locking Randy out of the house oh my god forcing him to sleep in his car every night and she would demand money from him constantly even at one point making her father give randy's checks to her so she didn't have to ask randy for his checks every friday and she controlled stays? everything well randy's a smart one okay eventually he gets away. randy gave up he left and went back to pennsylvania no one blamed him no one nope <laughs> <laughs> but two weeks later Shelly called him and begged to start over I'll be good this time he agreed to give it another chance but only if she comes out to Pennsylvania to live with him this time okay because he missed his daughter mm-hmm. he missed Nikki but it only lasted two weeks his family could not stand her they yeah. couldn't handle her behavior and he knew that there was no hope and filed for divorce And she repaid him by racking up all his credit cards instantaneously, leaving him in debt. He tried to pay it back with a tax return that he was supposed to be getting that required her signature. And she took that. She had someone else forge his signature, cash the check, and kept it. (laughs) Such a bitch. I don't know what other word to use for this lady. She's crazy. After this, Shelly disappeared. No one knew where she went. With the baby? No one knew where Nikki was at first. Okay. Laura was frantically trying to find them until one day she got a call from another family member telling her, can you please come get Nikki? Okay. The family member had been watching her for some time and said that Shelly just never came back for her. Oh, God. So Shelly was gone for almost a year. Okay. Laura took care of Nikki the entire time. She loved that little girl. And when Shelly showed up to take Nikki, everyone was really worried. Yeah, you would not want that to happen. It's her daughter. I know. Yeah, Laura did want to keep her. And she gave no explanation of where she had been that entire year. That poor little girl didn't even know her mom. Right, because she was so young. But she took her and for a moment it seemed like it was them against the world. And that is what she would tell Nikki that she was abandoned by everyone else and they didn't love her, only she did. Uh Uh-oh, so now she's going to warp this little child's mind. Yep. Worried about Nikki, Les and Lara made a drive to go see them since she wasn't answering their calls. Mm -hmm. She was living in an apartment in Vancouver at the time. There they ran into her neighbor, Danny, because Shelly wasn't home. They were worried about Nikki. They were worried that she might be leaving Nikki alone. Alone, Yeah. He offered to let them into her apartment because he had keys. Mm -hmm. And they asked why he had keys because he's just a neighbor and he didn't give a straight answer. Okay. It turns out that they were seeing each other. Probably. Yeah. They had been for a while. So once they found out about that relationship, it wasn't as surprising when they moved into a home together in Battleground shortly after. Okay. And this was actually the home that Grandma Anna left for Shelly. Okay. I don't know much about Danny and Shelly's relationship during this time other than that Shelly became pregnant again. Of course. With a second child and they ended up getting married in June of 1978. Shelly was 24 years old at this time. In August 1978, they had Samantha, which we will call her Sammy for the rest of the episode. Okay. Danny loved the girls and he was really good to them. Nikki called him dad, Mm -hmm. even though he wasn't her biological father. And this wasn't because she saw him as dad at first. This is something that Shelly does. Anytime Shelly had someone new in her life, she made Nikki call them dad. Like it could just be a boyfriend of two weeks and she would make her call him dad. That's messed up. Yeah. But Danny wasn't like Randy. He didn't put up with Shelly's crap. Okay, good. He had a backbone. But because of that, they were constantly fighting. Yeah. He would often leave to get away from her. And that is something we will come to find out. Shelly hated when people tried to run away from her. No. Oh. She loved to hunt down whoever left her. Like oh, literally great. hunt them down. She would yeah. pack the girls up in the car and scour the city for hours. Oh. <laughs> but it would be Shelly this time asking for a divorce, interestingly. 
Five years after they got married, Shelly asked her dad for money to divorce him, mm-hmm. and he gave it to her. Okay. There are a lot of details missing from this time in their life that I do not have, but it wouldn't be long until Shelly found yet another beau. Okay. And this is Dave. And Dave will be in this story for the rest of the story. Okay. So this is her final whipping boy. (laughs) This is her third husband. Or doormat or whatever. Yes. Dave grew up poor. Since the age of four, he grew up in Raymond. Out of high school, Dave worked as a logger like his father for a year before enlisting in the Navy. Mm -hmm. Coming back, he managed heavy equipment, specifically a bulldozer in the woods in the same industry. So he had a steady job. Just didn't make him a lot. He was good looking and he was available. Dave was kind and timid, not at all who you would imagine would end up doing terrible things. Oh, no. Dave is a conundrum in this story. He's definitely a victim in the beginning and throughout. But, you know, he became sort of a willing participant in some of the stuff that happens. So we'll have some feelings about Dave. They met in April of 1982 at a bar in Long Beach, Washington. Dave Notek was immediately obsessed with her. He thought she was out of his league, Okay, but it was her who approached him. Hmm. They danced and he asked for her phone number. He thought he would never see her again. She was beautiful, like a movie star, he said. <laughs> sure, he had her number, but he was shy and he didn't Wasn't think gonna he do. was going to have the guts yeah. to call her. <laughs> And he wouldn't run into her at the bar again because that bar that they met at mysteriously burned down the next day. Okay. And to me, I'm like, Dave, that was the universe telling you to run. (laughs) (laughs) Probably. (laughs) That was your sign. Instead, he worked up the nerve and he did call her. Okay. And they started dating. They lived in different towns, but he made a weekly trip to go see her. The girls were really wary of Dave, but Dave did immediately take to the girls and he really cared about them. But they had just been with another dad for five years. Right. And you now know, they love like, Danny. This is your new dad. Exactly. We've known each other two days. Call him dad. <laughs> exactly. And that's what she did. She literally demanded that it's they so call him up. dad. And it was really hard for them. But Shelly had a purpose for him right away. She's like, this is a man I can control. And that's all she looked for. She was on the verge of losing the house that Grandma Anna gave her. Okay. She didn't pay the taxes. Mm. She quickly claimed it over to Dave to try and save the house. Okay. The house had been in the family for three generations. Dave tried, but he didn't make tons of money, and the house did go into foreclosure. Oh, no. Before they knew it, they were packed up and moving to Raymond, Washington to move in with Dave because they had nowhere to go. Okay. Why? She needed a savior, and he mm-hmm. was like the savior for her. But that's just what she's telling him. And that makes him feel good. Right. One day, after a doctor appointment, she went to Dave telling him that she had cancer and okay. didn't have long to live. And Shelly even told her parents about the cancer. Okay. We're going to talk a lot about she's this making cancer. Shit up. But he believed her and was worried about what would happen to the girls if she died. So he invited them to come live with him. But before moving, Nikki had her first experience with her mother trying to harm her. Okay. Right before moving, Nikki woke up unable to breathe. There was a pillow pressed over her face. Oh, my God. She was screaming through the pillow, and instantly Shelly's face appeared, telling her that it was a bad dream. (laughs) This experience has never left Nikki. Uh, Yeah, no. Her mother tried to smother her. That's so wild. How old was Nikki at this time? She was seven, eight years old, I think. Wow. So she definitely is going to remember it. Absolutely. Mm Mm-hmm. She could have killed her, but she didn't. But Shelly likes to dole out pain. Yeah. It pleases her. And we're going to see a lot of that very soon. Oh, great. So the four of them lived in his studio apartment for a month before he got them a house, which is what they called the Louderback House. Okay. This was 1984. They got married a few years later on December 28th, 1987. He didn't marry her just because of the kids. He did love her. Okay. But the kids were a major driving force. Yes. Because they needed a dad and she's sick. She's sick in more ways than one. Very true. Kathy Lorena was one of the witnesses at the wedding. She was Shelly's hairdresser and friend. And I will be bringing her back into the story very shortly. Les and Laura were happy to see Shelly get married again. (laughs) It may have been for selfish reasons, but as long as she was with someone, it was less for them to deal with. (laughs) She's out of their hair. And she's a grown woman, too, now. Yeah, but it sounds like Les is still paying for a lot of things and enabling. But even Nikki, who was 12 now, could see that their marriage was not good from the start. Uh Uh-oh. Dave was just not built to handle Shelly and really struggled. Mm -hmm. It wasn't long before Shelly was tearing him down every day. Oh constantly berating him. She said he was a worthless husband. He didn't work hard enough. He didn't make enough. He didn't care enough about the kids. Nikki once witnessed him on the front porch, broken down, crying with a gun in his mouth. Oh, my God. He never fought back. He was submissive. 
He wasn't abusive ever towards her. Okay. Nikki said she rarely heard him even say a cuss word towards her. Shelly, on the other hand, would beat him. Oh, wow. The girls witnessed her slap him around a lot, and he would never hit back. Wow. (laughs) She was violent, and Dave didn't know how to handle it. He would try to leave, and she would hunt him down. If she couldn't find him, he would stay the night with his parents or friends. And if he had to be home, he would sleep in his truck. Okay. The only way to survive Shelly was to be away from her. And that's what people came to find out. Okay. Being with Shelly is what nightmares are made of. (laughs) She did everything she could to isolate him. And eventually she separated him and the girls from his family completely. Okay. He couldn't believe that he was in this situation. She had an uncontrolled anger that he didn't understand. He didn't know where it came from. He knew something was wrong with her, but she had a way of eating your soul. (laughs) And little by little, she broke him down until he just completely complied in every single way. Wow. Shelly had completely destroyed what was left of Dave. Mm -hmm. People have asked him, why didn't he leave? Right. They they always ask domestic abuse victims. Exactly. It's going to be the same reasons why others don't leave later that we're going to talk about. Okay. After Shelly hurts you, she loves you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Physically, emotionally, she will destroy you, but then she'll give you love. Mm -hmm. Just enough that you don't leave. Right. But it's way more complicated than that. But nothing was different in terms of how it was with her last two husbands. Dave was the only one that worked, and he worked overtime. He did all of the chores. Shelly did nothing. She did not clean. She did not cook. She sat around all day snacking and watching TV. (laughs) And she would even just, like, stuff her wrappers in the couch cushions. Like, she's just a gross person. What the fuck? Yeah. If Dave did something wrong or not the way she liked it, she would beat him. Up until this point, the girls' lives were certainly not perfect, Affection from their mother was scarce. Yeah. And there was discipline, but something in their mother changed once she knew that she finally had Dave completely whipped. Oh, no. And Shelly's violence escalated and no one was safe. This is when the extreme abuse of Nikki starts. Oh, God. Everything in the house was a weapon for Shelly to use against them. Cooking utensils, cords, belts, fishing poles, anything that she could get her hands on. She started beating the girls, although Nikki always got it worse. If she showed favor to anyone, it was Sammy. Okay. She quickly realized that she liked abusing them. She is sadistic. Wasted some years not doing it. It's her new hobby. Anything they did or didn't do or for no reason, they were punished. It was usually for simple things like losing something in the house. Oh, like being a normal child. Yeah. But mostly the girls didn't know why they were being punished. Mm. And if Shelly liked one particular way of punishing them, she would find ways to make it more severe. Most of the discipline happened at night after they had gone to bed. Okay. They would be startled awake to receive Uh whatever punishment Shelly had been brewing up. Mm. Just in case their mother threw them outside, which was often they wore extra clothes to bed. More often than not, a beating ended bloody. And this included punching and kicking them. This is a grown woman against children. Absolutely horrible. On one occasion, Nikki was being beaten, not knowing why, and begging her mom to stop. And when she tried to run away, her mother grabbed her and swung her up against a wall where there was a nail sticking out. (gasps) Oh, no. Nikki was literally stuck to the wall at that moment. Oh, my God. And only then did Shelly stop. And no matter how bad the beatings were, the kids were never taken to the hospital. They would just wear extra clothing to school to cover their bruises and scratches and other wounds. But the abuse wasn't all physical. Shelly loved mind games just as much. She could beat you one moment and love bomb you the next. She was intentional with some of her fucked up tricks. Christmas Day one year, she showered them with food, treats, gifts, only to take it all away and lock their gifts away in a closet. Wow. And then she would almost booby trap those closets so that she would know if anyone tried to get Get in in them. Yeah. She knew where everything was. Everything. Like, she was crazy Nazi about all this stuff. She was just looking for any reason that she could use against them for punishment. Yep, absolutely everything. And apparently she had a gifted photographic memory. I think so, yeah. One year for Nikki, it was a cabbage patch doll. I remember those. I had a couple. She instantly fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. And she would wait for her mom to leave the house and very carefully get it out of the closet just so she could hug it for a few minutes. She, yeah, needed that. And then put it back in the exact same way so her mom wouldn't know, even though sometimes she would find out. 
On another Christmas, Shelly had given both girls these tiny teddy bear pens. Okay. And after everything was unwrapped, there was a mountain of paper everywhere, like Christmas is. Right. Shelly asked where they were, and the girls didn't know. Mm -hmm. They tried to find them, and when they couldn't, they were beaten. She kept the girls up all night looking for them. And one of the girls finally found them both neatly stuffed into another gift. Oh, she did it on purpose. What a bitch. They knew right then and there. She picked them up and she put uh-huh. them in there on purpose. They were never missing. Oh, my God. She just wanted an excuse to beat them. Because it was her hobby. Yep. But it wasn't just toys Shelly withheld from the girls. Showers and going to the bathroom had to be approved by Shelly. Oh, my God. Showers were very rare. Okay. And usually only happened after certain types of abuse. Where they were bleeding or something. She would throw them in there. Oh, my gosh. Going to the bathroom often meant Shelly stood in the doorway watching you like a gel housekeeper. Wow. Or a creeper. <laughs> That's weird. Yeah. They had to wear dirty clothes to school. The girls started immediately going to the bathroom and sneaking showers when their mom was out of the house. Mm -hmm. Once clean, they would meticulously dry every surface and hide the wet towels so their mom wouldn't know. But then, like right before she got home, they would try to make themselves look just as disheveled as when she left. They just didn't want to feel dirty. Those poor kids. They didn't want to smell. Yeah. No, it was embarrassing for them. Yeah. They're going to get made fun of at school. And it just feels gross. Gross. It feels gross. Like, all of us want to shower. Yep. The girls were really close. Yeah, they're trauma bonded. But their mother did not want them to be friends. When she could get away with it, Sammy would sneak to Nikki's room and sleep with her. Yeah. But no matter what was going on in the house, there was always one area that looked like nothing bad was happening. And this was the front area of the home. Oh, so anybody who came by. Right. Outside, inside, right when you walk in. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. Even though almost no one visited the house, if you walked in, you couldn't tell that there was horror going on inside. Right. Shelly was just a lovely stay-at-home mom with a country style. She loved precious moments, figurines, (laughs) and they were everywhere. Those were huge in the 80s. I remember. Uh (laughs) There were also family photos everywhere, like too many, Mm, like way too many. It's like you don't trust the people who post the most on social media. I know. It was the same thing back then, like the families going and getting their like Olin Mills. Do you remember oh, that? Uh-huh. <laughs> and they had them hanging everywhere. You're like, hmm, that's weird. Something's weird. Mm-hmm. But yep, that was just to make sure you saw the girls smiling faces everywhere you turned. They're so happy. There couldn't possibly be anything going wrong in this home. And the girls always hoped that one day their mom would snap out of it and be the mom that they needed her to be. They always held out hope for this. And this was partially because of the random love bombing that she would do. Right. It's their mother. It's just an innate need for every child. Yeah. They want their mom to love them. Yes. But she took things up a notch again when she introduced a new form of abuse that became one of her favorites for a while. And she called this wallowing. Wallowing. This was something she made Dave do to the girls. Oh, no. At first, he argued against it. But okay. but then she beat him into submission. He would do it without question. Like, it's it's horrible. Okay. Always at Shelly's instructions from the porch or wherever she chose to watch from. He would do this, and it always happened at night, Oh no no matter the time of year. And remember, this is Washington, so we're talking about cold rain and snow. Okay. And this happened to Nikki more than Sammy, nine times out of ten. Nikki always got it worse. Yeah. So what's wallowing? She first abruptly wakes them up, yells at them to take off their clothes, and screams at them to get outside while she's screaming all these hateful things. Like, she she called her kids everything under the sun. Bitch, whore, worthless piece of shit, whatever she felt like. You name it. They would then be ordered to stand there or squat down in the mud in the middle of the night and they were sprayed down with the hose. Oh, my God. And while this is happening, they're yelled at to wallow. Shelly always from the sidelines would be like, make her wallow, Dave. And like Dave would be like, come on, wallow. Because if they didn't wallow, they're all beaten. It, well, it would just last longer and longer. And okay. It was freezing. And what happens next reminds me of Rose West. You know, after being sprayed down to the brink of pneumonia outside, Shelly would make Nikki get in a hot bath. OK. Which was painful for her because yeah, you're frozen. Her body, yes. All while calling her names and yelling at her to get cleaned up because now she's dirty. Now she's a dirty bitch and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Dirty so pig. this is something yeah. that they went through a lot in their childhood. It's like Shelly's just laying there at night thinking of like that's what exactly horrible what she's shit. doing because mm-hmm. Shelly sleeps during the day that's when she gets her sleep okay and at night when the kids go to bed it's like she just sits there mm-hmm. and thinks of how evil she can be yeah I don't get this she's crazy that was a soul that reincarnated from hell seriously maybe that's what happens that's why we have the evil people it's yep. the ones that come from the hell realm back to 
human form for a while. She's a demon. Yep. Over time, Sammy knew that Nikki's punishments were often much more severe than hers. She would watch from her room as her naked sister endured the abuse outside and wished that, you know, she was being tortured too. Oh. She knew her sister didn't deserve it. Yeah, none and of them. And she knew it was unfair. And she didn't understand why Nikki was the focus of her yeah. mom's rage. Maybe she was mad because it was Randy's child and he left her. Well, that's true. Like if I'm sitting here trying to... It, it really doesn't matter who you'll see, but okay, maybe it started out that way. Yeah. But at the same time, Sammy quickly learned how to manipulate her own mother a little bit. Okay. She would love bomb her mom mm-hmm. from time to time despite the abuse, and that resulted in her being the favorite. Oh, okay. Shelly also noticed that in school, Sammy had friends. Nikki didn't. So they thought maybe their mother was worried that Sammy would tell someone and they would believe Sammy. Oh. Sammy would also take whatever beatings came her way without trouble. She wouldn't complain. Mm-hmm. Like she knew it was going to happen anyway, so why fight it type Just of mentality. It yeah. Nikki, on the other hand, she always fought it because it was wrong. Yeah. So she was the main target. Shelly got off on hurting them. And when Nikki made it more obvious that she didn't like it, it just became more gratifying for Shelly. Yeah, she likes it. One summer, Shelly locked Nikki in one of the rooms for the entire summer. What? Sometimes she would come and lock her in the closet of that room. Wow. But she was there the entire summer. At first it was hard, but she looks back on that summer as the best one she had having to live with her mother. That's sad. Even though she had to use a bucket for the bathroom and was only let out to empty that bucket, she was happy to be away. Yeah, it's less abuse. At from the, Shelly. That so reminds me of Ariel Castro. That's true. Locked in a room with a bucket. Mm-hmm. Maybe they knew each other. Maybe they were. What was the timeline? <laughs> They're like, I can't what if remember. they were pen pals? <laughs> or Ooh, they were just um, pieces of the same wicked soul. Yeah, maybe. The sisters weren't allowed to talk to each other or see each other. Sometimes Sammy would have to be the one to go get the bucket, but that would be the only time she would see her sister. Unless, you know, Shelly's not paying attention or something, Sammy would go outside and grab pine cones and throw it up to the window just so she could see her face. Aww. But the reason why she loved this summer is because that room was where Shelly stored all her books. Oh, okay. Horror and mystery books. So she had something to do all She day. read every single book. Yeah. And that's where her love of reading started. Okay. One sweet moment that stuck out to me during this time was I guess the family dog had puppies and when Shelly was out of the house Sammy snuck a couple of puppies up in a bucket through the window for Nikki to cuddle for a while. (laughs) That's cute. And I thought that that was sweet. That's something I don't really have an answer for. We see this happen a lot where there's these evil people who like to abuse children or other people in their lives, but they're good with animals. I was like just thinking that when you said yeah. the dog with the puppies, I'm like, she probably didn't abuse them. There's not a whole lot of talk about it. I think she did abuse them too, but oh. just never to the extent of what she does to human beings. Mm-hmm. I think it really is just a matter of like, maybe she's not the kindest animal mom, but she's not the worst. Yeah. I, I don't know. There is a couple parts we'll come upon later, but I don't think it ever goes beyond that. So we'll we'll talk about it. When Nikki was finally let out of the room, it wasn't long before the physical abuse was back to normal. One day, Shelly shoved Nikki through a plate glass door in the kitchen. Oh, my gosh. And Nikki got cut up all over. She was bleeding and she was in shock. Shelly blamed Nikki for making her do that to her. Of course. But whenever the beatings got this bad, Shelly would turn into the mom that they wanted. She would apologize and promise that it'll never happen again Mm -hmm. and she'll be nice for a couple of days. And it was a tactic that she used again and again and again with everyone. Was she taken to the hospital? No. Falling through a glass door might have been explained away by falling or whatever, but not the other cuts and the bruises and the welts and various stages of healing. And Shelly knew this. The girls had been to the doctor before when they were younger because there wasn't much going on with yeah, them then. Yeah, started later. But Shelly preferred to handle all of these other injuries herself. She kept stacks of medical books in the house just in case. Wow. And if things couldn't get worse in that house, soon there's going to be another victim. Uh-oh. Hopefully not getting pregnant again. Oh, yeah, she will at some point. Shelly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Damn it. She's like Rose. Just kidding. I, I don't think I'm anybody gonna... is like Rose. <laughs> Rose had like how many kids? I, know. I lost count at right? one point. I just remember in that episode, you'd be like, and she's pregnant again. And she's pregnant. <laughs> I'm like, what? And I kept catching you too. I'd be like, can you guess? And you're like, no, what? And I'm like, she's pregnant. I'm like, because it just doesn't. 
doesn't it's not fathomable <laughs> that somebody has that many children i know until we start talking about extreme mormon families <laughs> yeah that's true anyway shelly's brother paul had a son named shane okay paul had had some issues and spent several years in and out of prison crime and biker gangs okay that was the youngest right that was the little one that was the hellion paul yeah paul was the youngest for a few of those years, Shelly had kept up communication with her young nephew, Shane Watson. Okay. She wanted to take him in, but Dave was against it for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. But when Paul ended up in prison again and Shane's mom was an addict, unable to care for him, Shelly officially took him in. She's like, yes, another victim. Yep. Even though he had been around a lot and dealt with a lot growing up, he was never abused and he was a good kid. Okay. But he had nowhere else to go. He had visited them before and was excited for a fresh start. Okay. He loved his cousins. Little did he know what he was in for. Yeah. Poor kid. At this point, Nikki is 14 and Sammy is 10. Shane is 13 years old. Okay. And Shelly and Dave are only 34 and 35. Once again, they're way younger than I you know. Would it think always in amazes story. me how young some of these people are when you hear about the shit they're doing. Yeah. You're like, you've done a lot for your young age. I know. A lot of really fucked up shit. Everything was good at first. Shelly made sure of that. Okay. You got to hook him in. Exactly. Shane immediately felt like he was part of the family. He got along well with the girls. And being the new kid in town, everyone was interested in him, especially the girls at school. <laughs> he was sweet and funny. He got his own space in the basement. Shelly bought him all sorts of new things. Out of appreciation of feeling so welcomed and loved, he started calling Shelly and Dave mom and dad. Okay. I'm sure it was very heavily suggested. I was about to say to she him. liked that. Yes. <laughs> that that happened. And the girls did ultimately see him as more of a brother than okay. a cousin. It wasn't too long before Shane started doing chores, a lot of chores. Okay. The list only grew every day. He was Cinderella. <laughs> she had him in the basement and yeah. he was doing all the work. Not a happy ending, though. No. No prints at the ball. No. <laughs> <laughs> At first, he protested, but soon realized that he was scared of Shelly. Mm. She wasn't who he thought she was. Yeah. He would do the chores without question. He became very close with Nikki. They're close in age, which makes yeah, sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And they had the same temperament, the two of them. Mm. They were very similar. Before he became her target for beatings, she started to take things away from him. Okay. Everything she bought him, she took away. One day it was his pillow, then it was his blanket, then it was his mattress. Ugh. He had to sleep on the concrete. Wow. Protesting this, he realized that fighting back in any way only earned him beatings. Mm. Then it was his shower and toilet privileges, just like the girls. Right. He was left with one set of clothes. Once the new kid in school, he was now the dirty, smelly kid. Oh, sucks. I Poor hate this lady. Thing. It just makes me think now that we do this podcast, anytime you see those kids in school that aren't as well taken care of, it's like, what the fuck is going on at their house? I know. And that's why they need to be checked on. They like, do. Not enough Instead is of done. like, you know, sometimes and I get it. Teachers, it's like the hardest job in the world. But if you have a child that everybody's making fun of and he's smelly and he's disheveled, it's like get CPS in there, I guess. I don't know. Like that's a. I think it's a hard one one to talk about because it could just be that the family is really struggling and we right. we don't need to be making it a big deal right they don't have access to right water or whatever but but if you I see that you can still go check in with that family and be like do you need some help exactly we can get you some clothes to get an idea of the situation i'm just sitting here thinking back to my high school days mm -hmm. and the kids that we all made fun of yeah. unfortunately we we're mean and mm -hmm. I, i'm just like what were they really struggling with right makes me feel like an asshole but you don't know when you're a teenager but then I also know of teenage boys with really bad B.O. And it's not because of their they family just, <laughs> life. They just really suck at trying to take care of themselves and they don't yeah. want to. Teenagers can be bad. They don't even want to. It's not just boys. It's girls, too. They don't yeah. want to brush their teeth. They mm -hmm. don't want to comb their hair. Sometimes you're like, ew. I know. All right. Anyway. Shane had been shuffled around so much that after moving in, he only heard from his grandparents occasionally once he was in the no tech house. Yeah. And this is grandparents from both sides. And that right. doesn't necessarily mean that they weren't trying. True. Because Laura was still involved as much as Shelly would let her. Yeah, I'm sure Shelly's not letting him come around. No. And at this point, Laura's actually divorced from Wes. So she oh, was really? like, I've okay. had enough of you. Like, the kids are gone. Goodbye. <laughs> but she still cared about her grandkids. Absolutely. Yeah. She would plan days and Laura would go and then they wouldn't be home. Mm. Laura would even wait hours for them to come home. And on one rare occasion, Laura was allowed to visit the girls and got inside the house. Okay. And the house was done up, you know. Mm. But Laura yeah. noticed a couple odd things here and there and asked the girls about it. Like the windows. The windows were nailed shut in area. 
areas. Oh, God. Yeah, that's weird. Or they had extra locks on mm-hmm. stuff. And all the girls would say is, well, mom did that. She's weird. <laughs> and Lara's like, yeah, she is. <laughs> I mean, she's always been a little bit paranoid, I guess, yeah. in a way. And Lara didn't see any sign of abuse. And the girls are not going to say anything. They're absolutely they're not going to say yeah. anything. Yeah. At one point, after a bout of waiting for them to come home, Shelly had no choice but to let Lara in. Okay. Because she wanted to see how Shane was doing and how he was adjusting. Yeah. And she went down to his room in the basement. At one point, Shane must have earned the mattress back or something, but that's all that there was. And Lara was just shocked. I bet. She yeah. was like, this is unacceptable. She's like, do you need money? Like, I'll mm-hmm. buy all this stuff for his room, you yeah. know? And Laura gave him the money. And Shelly's like, I'll take that Shelley money. Shelly yeah. did not do anything do for Shane. She already has all that stuff for him. She just took it away. Exactly. And even though Shane made it seem like nothing was wrong in private with Nikki, Shane and Nikki just always made sure to tell each other their real thoughts. Yeah. At first, Nikki did try to defend her mother because that's her mom. Right. But Shane gave her a reality check. He was quick mm-hmm. to stop her anytime she tried to say anything nice about her mother. He's like, this is not normal. That is not a good person in any way. Yep. It wasn't until he was there that Nikki really started to see everything for what it was. Yeah. And that it wasn't okay and that she was a victim Mm -hmm. because she was torn. In a way, she loved her mother. She clung on to those small moments that she experienced when her mom was loving. Yeah. And she thought, despite all the abuse, that it was better than having no mom at all. Oh, yeah. When that's not true. When that's not true. (laughs) Exactly. You don't need a mom if that's your mom. Shelly quickly moved on Shane. He was soon experiencing everything that Nikki was made to do and more. Mm. He was made to walk as well but just like with everyone else she did give him those tiny loving moments only fleeting and now Shane's connected to his cousins yeah she finds a way to do things that make people stay yeah you know and then they have moments of clarity and try and run away and then are brought back how do they learn how to be this like cruel and gaslighty like how do these people (laughs) learn these tactics I mean she had an actual person that she saw Well, she learned it it from grandma yeah and grandma learned it from somewhere too and she's obviously smart she's read a lot of books yeah I don't know But that's what she does. She breaks people down until they are submissive to her in every way. At one point, for a reason unknown to everyone, she made Shane and Nikki undress in the living room and they were made to slow dance together. That's so weird. They're young teenagers. That's so messed up. There was nothing like they weren't made to do anything sexual or anything like that. It's just awkward. It was just to humiliate them. Yeah. But I do think that Shelly has a thing with nudity. I don't know what it is because she never does anything, okay? Like, she's never touching anybody or doing anything, but she likes to see naked bodies. Okay. And always when she's belittling someone or... Right. It's just another layer of her control. It's humiliation when you make somebody strip down. Yes. So that's slow dancing happened more than once. It was always around the times when Nikki was made to undress that she started to resent Dave when he was there because he wouldn't do anything, you know, and he was a part of the abuse sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it was always at the request of their mother. But in these moments, like seeing them nude and stuff like she just thought it took it way too far. Well, yeah. And he he should have done something, but he didn't because he would have been abused as well. He just didn't want to fight with her, too. That's what I'm saying. He's just like, whatever. I can't change it. It sucks because specifically in the times when she was humiliating them by dancing together. Shane and Sammy are crying. Right. And Dave's just sitting there. It's not like he's right. He's admiring it, but he's not doing anything. One day, Shane and Nikki came home from school and they could just feel that something was going to happen to them. She immediately yelled at them to take their clothes off. Oh, no. They thought that they were going to have to wallow or dance. But Dave wasn't home. And usually she did that stuff when Dave was home. Okay. Because she never did the spraying of the hose with the wallowing. She made Dave do it every time. too lazy. (laughs) And it wasn't (laughs) nighttime either. So they're wondering why. why. Yeah. But it was something new. Oh. They were made to go outside in the winter. There was snow all over the ground. They were made to sit on a hill behind the house with their backs to each other. They didn't know what they had done. Nothing, of course. Never. They were freezing and were just made to sit out there. Just naked. Just naked. There. They both agreed that they hated Shelly and that they needed to get out of the house. They sat there thinking of ways that they could kill her. So this became like a little game yeah. for them. Like it, it was never anything it was like they're super co- crazy. Yeah. It was like their coping mechanism. Right. It was the only way that they got through some of this stuff. Like they would talk about throwing a radio in a bathtub yeah. type of thing. It wasn't like, I'm going to stab her. <laughs> it wasn't anything too violent. It exactly. was like, how do we do this quickly and efficiently? 
I wish they had because it sounds like she's not going to stop and she needs yeah. to be taken out of the world. I think they thought of the bathtub thing because I remember reading that Shelly would make them draw her bath and they're not allowed to take baths themselves, but she would make all the kids together make a perfect bath for her so that they could just be sad because they never get that. I think so. It's that just was another, another sadistic. Exactly. Yeah. And the whole time Shelly would stand there with her robe half open. That's another rose. That's a very rose reference. thing. Yeah, she would be showing a boob or something like that. Nobody wants to see their mom just wandering around naked. <sighs> I mean, it's okay if they're just, you know, like yeah. in the course of normal things, but when they're purposefully like, here's my tit. <laughs> that's weird. So weird. <laughs> While they were sitting out there, Shelly came to check on them several times just to yell at them and tell them not to talk to each other. <laughs> like, you have them back to back outside. What are, they supposed, what to are do? they supposed to do? She only brought them in once it was night and it started to hail. Oh, my gosh. And just for timeline here, all that Shane has experienced up to this point happened all in a few months wow. of being there. These kids, and now Shane, had already experienced so much at the hands of Shelly and Dave, but Shelly wasn't done collecting victims the next victim is going to be her best friend, Kathy. So now we're going Another to adults. Adult. Oh, shit. That was the girl who was in her wedding? Yes. Kathy Loreno, who was only 30 years old at the time, she was at the wedding. They had been friends for several years. Kathy was a tall woman. She was almost six feet tall. Wow. She had thick brown curly hair, although like a lot of hairdressers do, she often changed her hairstyle. She was a bubbly, wonderful woman. And although she could be direct, she was a lifelong people pleaser okay. and giver. Just right for the picking. That's why Shelly befriended her. Yep. She started babysitting for Shelly from okay. time to time. And Sammy really took to her. Mm -hmm. Kathy was always ready to do Sammy's hair. <laughs> oh. Sammy loved her. She felt like Kathy was a second mom to her. Okay. Shane and Nikki didn't care for her at first. They just felt like she was just another adult in the house barking orders. Okay. And what I didn't tell you yet, and this definitely feels like a Rose West moment too, is Shelly was... Can you guess? Pregnant. Pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> it's time. Against Dave's wishes, Shelly announced to everyone that Kathy was moving in. Why? To help with the baby? Yes, to help with the baby. Kathy had also run into some hard times. She lost her job at the salon for not making enough sales. Okay. She lost her home. And she had moved in with her mother, who she had done so much for. She even previously bought a home near her mother just to be close. But soon her mother was demanding rent from her. And she's like, yeah, I've taken care of you for so long. Kathy had no way to pay. So Shelly offered to put her up mm. in exchange for free room and board. She, she would abuse her. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't know that part. No, that, that, that was, was in the, the fine notes. Yeah, the fine print. <laughs> but she would help with the children, help yeah. with the baby when it came, and also help Shelly get to her cancer appointments. Oh, she still, she still has that. cancer. Okay. Dave and Shelly's first and only child together would be Tori. Oh. So Tori is child number three. Another girl. And she was born in June 1989. Dave would go on to say that her birth was the only happy time in his marriage to Shelly. But it also meant another mouth to feed. And now with Kathy in the house too, and no one else working but him, it was really starting to put a lot of pressure on him. Yeah. At first, Kathy was all about Shelly. She looked up to her, and when she looked at the house, she just saw a bunch of unruly kids that were making Shelly's life hard. Oh, God. She would advocate for Shelly and ask the kids, why don't you help and support your mom? Like, she's pregnant. She's sick. What are you doing? Okay. How can you be so horrible to her? Part of this came from the fact that Shelly was obsessed with Tori being sick. As soon as Tori was born, it's the Munchausen by proxy. Yes. She was just so convinced that Tori's sick or she's on the verge of death. And yeah. she would say that Tori was born early. She was born like a week early. <laughs> it wasn't she's not a preemie. anything. She told everyone that Tori had breathing and heart problems. And every night the house was woken up to some kind of alarm with the baby. But one time, Nikki came downstairs and found Shelly holding a pillow over oh, the baby. No. And when she noticed Nikki, she snapped out of it and said, she's OK. She's OK now. Because <laughs> you're not smothering her. So they had to deal with that whole thing. She mm -hmm. got over it eventually. But that was its own drama in the house. That was just this layer that Kathy saw. OK. Not only is she sick, but she has a sick baby. Like and poor Shelly. Yeah. Poor, poor Shelly. After this, Nikki and Sammy were really concerned for their baby sister. Yeah. And they tried to keep a closer eye on Shelly with mm -hmm. the baby. 
Eventually, Kathy took over mostly, taking care of the baby. Okay. But again, familiar to Rose West, Shelly did like being pregnant and she did love babies or she pretended to love babies. She just liked dressing them. (laughs) But nothing else. Nothing else. And she did wait to abuse. Yeah. She didn't start till they were older. older. So I don't know. Is there just like this fucked up morality in these people's minds that they go by? I don't know. Anyway, things in the house with Kathy shifted after Sammy's 11th birthday. Okay. Shelly loved to throw parties. She loves to give gifts only to take, take them, them away, away later. <laughs> but she loved feeling important. And yeah. Like, making her look like a good mom. Right. At the party, Kathy gave Sammy a little gold necklace with a heart pendant. Okay. It was real. And mm. Sammy felt special because she really loved Kathy. When Shelly asked Sammy what her favorite gift was. Oh, no. She pointed to the necklace around her neck. And that really pissed yeah, off Shelly. No. Later that night, Shelly beat Sammy. Right. And Sammy usually isn't the one that gets like beaten, beaten. Sammy knew then that things were changing for her because she couldn't really be seen as the favorite anymore. Now there's a baby Tori too. Yeah. And she's hitting her teenage years, which is when Shelly likes to abuse the most. So coming back to the cancer real quick too. Yes. I think at this point, Shelly is saying that she has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay. At one point after she had the baby, she called Laura to say that they had made a mistake and it was actually cancer of the pituitary gland. Okay. And Laura, who actually has been working in the medical field for some time, started to question her. That's mm-hmm. when she started to be like, what? Um, How did they make that That's a mistake? big difference. <laughs> but Shelly was adamant she didn't have much time. Okay. In the beginning, Laura was very happy for Kathy's help in the house. Finally, someone was answering the phone and telling her how her grandchildren were doing. Kathy would update her on Shelly's treatments. Yeah. Which, again, would only further Lara's suspicions that Shelly wasn't being truthful because she would tell colleagues about Shelly's diagnosis and the treatments and nothing They're matched like, up. No, that's not what we would do. Lara finally confronted Shelly and called her out on it. Okay. I think you're lying about cancer. Mm. <laughs> Shelly hung up on her. Yeah. And Kathy called Lara back, sounding very afraid and telling her that she upset Shelly. And she's like, now I'm going to get beaten. And then Dave gets on the phone and Laura questions him. Yeah. She finds out that he has been taking her to these chemo treatments all this time and never once did he go in the room with her. Mm-hmm. He waited all day in the waiting room for her. Mm-hmm. And Laura said, it doesn't take all day, Dave. Was she just sneaking out the back door? <laughs> he wouldn't believe Laura. Like he truly believed that she had cancer. She had cancer. Yeah. No sane person would keep this up for years. She's not sane. She's not sane. She was sneaking out another door and shopping while he sat there waiting for her. (laughs) So fucked. Kathy was starting to question some things too, but at the same time, her personal autonomy was shifting. Shelly had done a good job of isolating her. She was still involved in some activities outside of the house, softball and church. But with the responsibilities at the house, she stopped going and she started to fade away. Mm. She became Shelly's slave. Yeah. Shelly was never satisfied, even though Kathy was now doing everything. Right. Absolutely everything. And if she ever did something wrong or a way that Shelly didn't like it, she was now being the one that was beaten. Oh, God. And again, with anything Shelly could get her hands on in that moment... A book, a cord, a spatula. Wow. This grown woman is now abusing her so-called best friend. That's crazy. And that woman stayed. Mm -hmm. And that's what's hard is we can't put into words exactly how she speaks to these people. How she manipulates them and makes them them. feel Mm -hmm. like they can't leave. If she's blackmailing them, maybe she knows some deep, dark secrets they're ashamed of. I don't know about like the deep, dark secrets, but she has a way of making sure that they feel like Shelly is their ride or die in the beginning. Yeah. And then... And finds ways to like be this roller coaster of emotion with them that they still feel like she's it and they start to believe her bullshit. So anyway, this grown woman is now being abused. And at first, Kathy would cry or threaten to leave. Mm -hmm. But Shelly did everything in her power to put the blame right back on Kathy for why it happened. And this is when the systematic physical and psychological abuse of Kathy really began. After hurting Kathy, she would blame Kathy for it because of whatever she said and then hug her and tell her that she needs her. Like, I need you. I need you. After this, she started feeding Kathy pills. Oh, that's one way to keep her. Yep. She started playing a really sick game with her, claiming that Kathy was sleepwalking and eating all the food in the house during the night. Okay. Kathy would fight for her innocence in it, but Shelly had a way of breaking her down. She put food under her bed while she was sleeping or like crumbs and wrappers in her sheets for weeks until (laughs) Kathy believed her that this is something she was doing. 
And the kids knew that Shelly was doing this. They witnessed her put a full cake under Kathy's bed one day. Oh, my God. But when Shelly would gaslight Kathy during one of these arguments, asking the children if they did it, you know, the children would, of course, say no. Because they didn't. They didn't do it. (laughs) But eventually, Shelly even made the children be the ones to hide the food under her bed. The kids saw this shift. At first, Nikki and Shane didn't like Kathy, but now they felt really bad for her. Yeah. But setting their mom straight would just mean that they they, got beaten. Yeah, exactly. And even though they didn't want to see Kathy hurt, as long as she was Shelly's focus, their lives were a little easier. Mm -hmm. It was an impossible situation. But then it shifted from Kathy sleepwalking to eat to her sleepwalking naked and going to Shane's room. Oh, no. Shelly would accuse Kathy of wanting a child. Oh, no. Kathy was shocked. She would never. Right. But then she would make Shane agree that it was happening. Oh. Kathy ran upstairs crying. That's some real psycho shit. I know. I don't even understand. Like, who comes up with this? She lays there and thinks of, like, the most... Yeah, I'm going to convince her that yeah. she's trying to molest a child. And then she'll never leave the house her because I'm going to tell people that she's a child molester. Right. So it's like this game. Yep. One day after this, Kathy went tumbling down the stairs. Mm. When the kids ran to look, Shelly was standing at the top of the stairs. Of course. And yelled down to Kathy, calling her stupid and clumsy. Then Shelly started taking away all her things like she had done before. Bathing and using the restroom were only allowed if Shelly said she could. Then item by item, everything that was Kathy's that she brought into the house was taken away. All of her personal things, including her clothes. She was left with one bra, one pair of panties, and a muumuu. Wow. But soon, even those were gone. Should it be naked all the time? And Shelly forced her to do all the chores in the house nude. She must have liked that. In front of children. That's so weird. That's so weird. It is weird because you have these freaking children who are watching this woman doing all their dishes and all this stuff just naked. But naked. You don't want to see anybody naked. No. Not while they're just like walking around. Like they're doing chores. Yeah. And it's not safe. She's probably like trying to cook dinner and stuff. I know. Can you imagine? (laughs) Oh, man, I didn't even think about that. Often she would lock Kathy inside a closet and Shelly would stand outside of it saying, I love you and I'm helping you and we need to get you better and I'm here to protect you. I'm the only one that can protect you. Like she really tore her down. Wow. And when she was allowed to bathe, it wasn't inside. It was the garden hose. Oh, like a dog. Like a dog. Kathy didn't fight back. By now, Kathy was aware of the abuse towards the children, too. I'm sure. Yeah. And she knew that as long as Shelly's focus was on her, the children wouldn't get the worst of it. Oh, so she was kind of protecting them yeah. in a way. And the kids also wrestled with what was happening. You know, Kathy was larger than Shelly by quite a why bit. Why didn't, yeah. And they didn't know why she wasn't fighting back. She could fight back. She could leave. Psychologically, she was She was toast, already getting there. You know? Yeah. You know, she had a car, too. She could have stood up for herself. They just thought something was wrong with Kathy. And remember, she is being drugged. I don't think the kids telling the story know to what extent that was making her behave on a daily basis. Right. They also didn't understand the psychological torture that Shelly was inflicting on her. Yeah. She was inflicting this on an already vulnerable person. She finds That's what she looks for. Mm -hmm. Right. They were so confused. The kids were so confused. They were sad. They didn't want to be the ones to be punished, but soon Shelly included the children in some of Kathy's abuse. And this is the stuff that haunts them forever. I'm sure. She made them flick rubber bands at her naked body (laughs) when she wasn't moving fast enough. But she made Shane do far worse. Oh, no. Shelly would instruct Shane to punch and kick her, and he would. But Shane's also next in line. So now there's this hierarchy of who gets more abuse. You have Kathy, Shane, Shane, Nikki, Sammy. Tori's getting none right now because she's a baby. And it sucks because as a result, Kathy became very afraid of Shane. But this was because Shelly would instruct Shane out of view to do something to her. So she didn't realize. She didn't realize at first that it was coming from Shelly. She just thought all of a sudden there is this teenage boy who wants to abuse me. Right. And, you know, that whole manipulation of her trying to touch him in the night or whatever. Oh, yeah. That's part of this. getting back at her. Right. But then Shelly would come after this so-called abuse from Shane and save Kathy from Shane. Yeah, he's the bad guy. She once hid Kathy in her closet all day to keep her from Shane. (laughs) And the kids are watching this stuff like unfold in horror. Their mother is this circus conductor of terror. Mm -hmm. But Shane knew better than to fight Shelly on whatever she wanted. Shane did try running away several times. 
every time Shelly would make everyone get in the car, hunt him down, and they would find him. Ugh. And every time Nikki's praying, you know, I hope we don't find Please him. him. I hope yeah. we don't find him. Even though she would miss him, like he was her rock in the house, really. Yeah. And sometimes it would take multiple days. They would just stay out looking. Oh, like man. she would look in trees and bushes. She was a scary hunter. He needed to get on a bus and get, I mean, he had no money. I know. That's what she takes away everything from you. He probably barely had clothes to leave he had the house in. Yeah. yeah. So, however many days it took, Shelly would find her victim. And then abuse them more for exactly. leaving. It's Because oh. it's not just the abuse that, you know, Shane's running from. He doesn't want to abuse Kathy. No. This sucks, you know. And as this went on, every now and then, one of the children would cave and try to help Kathy. It was difficult seeing what was happening to her. Right. But Kathy would refuse their help. She knew that she was their lifeline, not yeah. the other way around. But she was no longer the person that she used to be in no. just a short amount of She's time. She's broken down real quick. She lost a lot of weight. Her teeth were starting to rot. Oh, no. And her hair was starting to fall out. What was left of it? Because Shelly had done her chop job, which is just one of Shelly's things. Oh, just like, like grandma. It down to the scalp. Just the chop. Just and rough probably, chops. And she's probably not getting food or anything that she needs. Yeah, we'll talk about she's that. She's malnourished, I'm sure. So where is Dave throughout all of this? Well, he's working. We know he works all her time. But this is when you really start to see Dave become her accomplice, I guess. Okay. This is when he takes it too far and you're like, oh, okay, I maybe understood the wallowing before, but this is when, how does a human being not stand up to someone else? Right. One of the things is every now and then the family would all leave to go do things. Okay. With no more room in the car because you have three children, two Mm -hmm. people up front. They made broken down Kathy right in the trunk. What? She didn't trust leaving her home alone. So she went everywhere with them out of sight. Wow. She never fought. She would just get in. Once the family went on a camping trip, the entire time Kathy was just Shelly's servant there. Yeah. Never actually spending any time enjoying camping. The first night she didn't get to sleep in a tent like the others. She slept under the car and the next night it was back to the trunk. What the fuck? Later, the kids still confused why Kathy wasn't trying to get out of the situation had narrowed it down to the pills that Shelly had been giving her. While Shelly was out one day, Shane and Nikki went into Shelly's room where she had so many prescriptions. Oh, so they didn't even know which ones well, she was given. Well, all they could tell was based on what they looked like. Okay. If they could see what she was handing to Kathy. And one of them was Prozac. Shane took one to see how it would affect him. And less than half an hour later, he was loopy. And this is one of the pills that Shelly was making Kathy take throughout the day. More yeah. than needed. And that's just one of them. Prozac, yeah, it does things in your brain. Shane and Nikki wondered if they had ever been drugged because there were times they could remember when they didn't quite feel right. And they probably were. Just as a reminder always, even though Kathy is the main focus, the kids are still getting abused. It's yeah, just not, not like, as often. Or often, something. right. Mm-hmm. And Shane's abuse was drastic. I mean, when it was his turn to be abused or whatever, it was always more in some way compared to others. And mm-hmm. I think because he's a boy, maybe yeah. in her brain, she's like, he can handle more. I got to take it up a notch for this boy, masculine strength or whatever. One of his punishments, she duct taped him to the wall naked for hours. Ouch. Or she would make him strip naked and both of his hands and feet would be bound with duct tape. And Shelly spread icy hot all over oh his gosh. genitals. No one knew what Shane did to deserve that special kind of treatment, including Shane. And to this day, no one does. Uh, Nobody deserves that. That's what Kenneth McDuff did to his victims. Oh, I know. When he was a teenager, he would do that to the girls. It's so fucked up. They all think of the same sadistic. That's what I'm wondering. Is there like a playlist? It's a hive mind for fucked up There has to be. They're all from the same fucked up soul in hell. That's a cool theory. I'm in my reincarnation mode. Yeah. (laughs) So I just feel bad for Shane because he's the only boy, too. So it's like, yeah, it's his junk out and about. And Mm -hmm. he has to be around all these girls like that. So it's an extra layer of humiliation. Exactly. And he's a teenager boy. And he's a teenage boy. Awkward anyways about that. Then I just always come back to and they have to see this grown woman naked every day. I know. (laughs) Poor Kathy. And at some point, whether she was made to do it or had no energy, Kathy literally crawled around the house on all fours to get around. Wow. And by this point, Shelly had moved her downstairs. She had moved her into a five by eight oil furnace room. The walls were unfinished. Okay. Just exposed studs. 
and they had stuffed a mattress in there, but it wouldn't be long before that was taken away, and she was sleeping on the concrete floor. Oh, my God. When Kathy was first moved into that room, Sammy felt really bad for her. Well, yeah. She tried putting up posters for her in there, Aww. so it didn't look so bad, and Kathy was like, don't do it. You know, she was terrified of what so Shelly was going to do, yeah. and sure enough, Shelly ripped them down, and she got a scolding or a beating or whatever. Just any comforts they were allowed had to come from Shelly as a gift. Yeah, she's the god of the castle or king of the castle or whatever. Right. One night, Shelly was particularly angry with Kathy. For what? Who knows? But the kids watched from inside the home while Shelly and Dave made Kathy do something. And this is when, like, you want to sometimes feel bad for Dave, but when he can be a part of this, I just can't, you know? Yeah. Shelly and Dave made Kathy walk to the top of the hill outside naked. Okay. It was on a freezing night. It had snowed a few days before, so the ground was kind of this mixture of snow and just kind of icicles. Once at the top and begging to go back inside, Dave was instructed to give her a nudge and she slid down the hill. Oh, my God. Shelly yelled at her to get back up and go back up to the top. She crawled up and she was made to slide down again and again and again and again. And this went on for hours. How miserable would that be? Like, I've been sledding with clothing on. Yes. And after a while, you're cold through your multiple layers of clothing. I can't imagine. The next morning, the kids went outside and there was a bloody path all the way down the hillside. Oh, just like was taking her skin off. Yeah. At this point, Kathy had been with them for more than two years. Shit. In March of 1991, Kathy's mother was having major heart surgery. Mm -hmm. And Kathy's family knew that she was staying with Shelly. So they tried reaching out to Shelly, but Shelly avoided them and said that Kathy had moved away and moved in with her boyfriend, Rocky. Okay. To make it seem like the truth, a while later, Shelly made Kathy write a letter explaining where she was with this Rocky guy and that she was okay. But the truth is, is they couldn't imagine the reality of what Kathy's life was right now. No parent would ever think that's what's happening. My God. Especially staying with another, like, a grown woman. friend. Exactly. I would never, ever. Ever. Now I question everything in my life. (laughs) I know. Everyone I ever meet. (laughs) Later in a home video that was confiscated, the family was all at the beach and Kathy was caught on camera. And her teeth were black nubs. Oh, my God. And her skin was sagging from the weight loss. Oh, my God. And like she's just there in that video. She's just a shell. Just so sad. Of a being. So skipping forward a year in the summer of 1992, Dave and Shelly decided to move everyone. So they're leaving the Lauterbach house and they're moving to a farmhouse in Raymond on Monahan Landing Road. And this is the home that will come to be known as Shelly's House of Horrors. All the other stuff sounded pretty fucking horrible, but there's going to be more. Well, yeah, because she tortures people. It's her job in life. She's like a real life horror movie. She is. Something I haven't mentioned, but I think does help paint the picture a little bit better and why Dave, even with everything he does, is this victim sometimes. He wasn't there for all of the abuse. In fact, most of it. Somebody had to pay all the bills. Exactly. So, you know, he comes home and he did that thing with Kathy. Right. And he did the wallowing thing. Right. When it comes to the kids, he just thinks it's some kids got to be disciplined a little bit harder than others when they're okay. acting out. But he doesn't see what Shelly does all week. All day. Yeah. And everything that he did was at her demand or whatever. Yeah. He was gone Monday through Friday working and not just gone, like gone, gone. He worked five hours away, so he didn't even oh, stay at the house throughout the week he only drove home like saturday mornings and would leave sunday night okay he had no idea while he was gone he lived in a tent near his job because shelly has all the money wow the reasons for why they moved to this new house is unclear because shelly didn't really like it it was smaller it had less rooms but it was on five acres which meant privacy yeah even though they did have neighbors Shelly, Dave, and Tori slept in the master bedroom on the first floor. Nikki and Sammy got the two rooms upstairs. Shane was made to sleep in Nikki's closet. Oh, my gosh. Kathy was made to sleep on the floor in the living room. And there was only one bathroom, which was next to Shelly's bedroom. So Mm. no one could sneak anything. That's horrible. One bathroom for the whole house? Yes. Yeah, that sucks. To give some perspective, because I know in a story that lasts for decades, you can get distracted. Yeah. (laughs) So right now, Shelly's 38, Dave's 39. Nikki and Shane are both 17 at the moment. Sammy is currently 14 and baby Tori is now three. Okay. This home needed a lot of work Mm -hmm. and Shelly had her slaves to help her fix it up a bit. Yeah. One of the craziest things is that she gave Nikki a one inch paintbrush to paint the house. It It took her all summer. I was going to say that would take you months. Took her all summer. 
Sammy was made to paint another large building, but she was given proper tools to do that. That's, she just fucking with hates people. Nikki. She just like fucking with people. She just yes, exactly. At this new home, abuse became more frequent for the girls. But again, mostly Nikki. Mm -hmm. Nikki was her punching bag. Whenever she felt like it, she would just go up to Nikki and bite her or slap her or punch her. Shelly slapped her in front of schoolmates once. Wow. It really embarrassed her. And once Shelly went to Nikki's school, dragged her out of class, made her open her locker and tore everything out of her locker because she said Nikki stole her mascara. Oh, my God. <laughs> How do you not realize that's not a mom with her head on Right. Where's straight? the school officials here going, wait a minute. But still, there's nothing that compared to the abuse of Kathy and what Shane experienced. Kathy, who wasn't allowed to bathe inside, was still being hosed down outside naked. But soon, Shelly started pouring bleach all over her body. Oh, my God. Calling her a filthy pig. To this day, the girls flinch at stores I, when they see bleach bottles. Because every time this happened, Kathy would scream. Well, yeah, it's burning her skin. And she had all these open wounds oh and God, sores. Like, it was oh. incredibly painful. Instinctively, Kathy would try to run away, but she would just be duct taped and held down. And sometimes Kathy would pass out from the, the abuse. Mm -hmm. And Shelly had some kind of liquid. And I was trying to find out what it was. But she had this little liquid that would wake anybody up who had passed out. And she would wake her up and continue the abuse. That's horrible. And this is when I get confused about what Dave thought of Kathy. Because he helped with that whole hillside. And he has to see her like just. Yeah, like yeah, she's changing. Deteriorating. Right. Her teeth are gone. Like, what do you think's happening while you're gone, dude? Exactly. But see, what happens is when Dave came home on the weekend, sometimes he wouldn't see Kathy at all. So he thought she was gone or something. I don't know if he realized the situation in its entirety. Sometimes I think he thought Shelly only abused people when they did something really fucked up. I was about to say, something. what is Shelly telling Dave that exactly. like Kathy's a drug addict, that she's hurting the kids, that she's doing something right. that is deserving of this? Yeah, that she there's always something. Yeah, she's abusing the young boy. Because when it comes to others, it's something based on what Shelly says. So yeah. he would ask, you know, where is she? And mm -hmm. the kids told him, well, Shelly has her sleeping in the pump house outside. Oh my God. So he confronted Shelly about that, but she has her way of manipulating him. And by the mm -hmm. weekend, Dave, he has no energy. He's, he's working exhausted. from morning till night yeah. and he's doing physical work. And he's sleeping in a tent. He's sleeping in a tent and he's driving like five hours to get home. He's there for like half an afternoon, one night, you know, half a day and then driving back. Shelly said that Kathy was in the pump house to protect her from their abuse of children, specifically oh, Shane. OK. She said that Shane was the main abuser all on his own and that he targeted Kathy and he believed Shelly because one of the weekends he came home, he found Shane dragging Kathy around by her feet. Okay. And Shane's not going to speak up and say, Shelly told me to I'm do this. I'm not doing this yeah. because I want to. So he was made to believe that Shane had this evil side to him. Okay. So it didn't shock him one day when Kathy ran away and Shelly was furious. <laughs> she finally got it. enough nerve. I guess. Kathy hadn't tried to run away before. So, you know, well, you got to go find her. She had the kids run around the property and nearby woods searching for her with all of them secretly praying again that she gets away. Please don't find her. Shelly left in the car to go search for her. And sadly, it wasn't long until she did find her. Damn it. Shelly shows up with Kathy back at the house a couple of hours later. And Kathy was in a new outfit. She was clean. She had bags of clothes from the store. And because, the kids were dumbfounded. Yeah. Shelly's like, I'm going to treat you better. Exactly. We're going to be best friends again. They couldn't believe that she came back. No. They couldn't believe it. Because they knew what this shopping trip was. It was just a Band-Aid right. for a few days. She even let her sleep in the house for a few days. Oh, generous. But then it was all gone and she was back in, in the, the pump, pump house, house, which is cold and musty. And it's only four feet by four feet. Damn. With yeah, a like pump. Sleeping like curled up in a fetal position. This wasn't the last time Kathy tried to run away. She did try again and again. And Shelly just would always find her and always bring her back. Sammy, who really cared for Kathy, she would try to bring her like old couch cushions to sleep on and then she would go and check on her again and Shelly had taken them away. Yeah. And anytime she was let out of the pump house to do some kind of chore, she was beaten. Mm. Shelly would randomly shove her to the ground really hard for no reason. One of the times she landed face first on concrete. Ouch. And if she had any teeth. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. And over the weeks, Kathy was getting worse and worse. 
it was obvious that her health was going downhill very fast. Yeah. Kathy wasn't the only one to stay in the pump house. She did make Nikki and Shane do it from time to time. It's like solitary confinement. And it became one of her favorite things to do because she loved punishing them, but she could lock them in there for an unknown amount of time. Mm -hmm. Like this out of sight, out of mind thing. And then this is also when she started, she might have done it before, but this is when I first see it in the story. She started giving the kids and Kathy, whenever she wanted to, muscle relaxers no. so that they couldn't move yeah, or really do anything. So this might have been also what happened in this next part, but I didn't see it described in that way. So one day, Kathy's in the pump house and Shelly's leaving and Shane, you know, he's Kathy's main abuser or whatever. Right. Shane took the chance, despite the risk to him, to free her. Okay. He opened the door. She was super frail. She's lost over like 100 pounds. She had like a couple nubs left. Right. And Kathy just cried and she didn't get out. And Shane was like getting mad at her. Like, get leave. out. Leave right now. She didn't believe him at first. Because she thought it was another game. She thought it was a trick. Mm -hmm. and he's like, it's not a trick. Like, this is your only chance. Please. And go. She's just like, if I leave, they'll just find me. She's given up. She yeah. will. And she begged Shane to let her be. And he was shocked because that was her only chance because they could tell something's happening. She's, She's about dying. To die. mm -hmm. They knew the next step for Kathy was death. Yeah. And she had given up. I mean, that would be like a welcome relief at this point for her. Probably. probably. And that's where I'm going to end today. Okay. Because there's a lot left. But as you can tell, Shelly's fucking crazy. I just can't believe it's going to keep going on. It's going to keep going on. This is half the story. I Once again, I'm just shocked and dismayed that people like this exist in our world. And I don't get think they're away people. with it for a long, long time, too. I just feel like they're not people. They have to be I know. demons. They yeah. have to walk amongst us because I cannot fathom... I know humans are fucked up and they can be depraved, but wow. Yeah. And it doesn't end. To do this to other people, like, or animals. Right. It's dark. So stay tuned, everybody. Come back for part two next week. To hear more shocking details. Yes. More people that she's going to draw into her web. Mm-hmm. That will happen. There are some good things to come out of all of this. Good. But typically, a lot of bad things have to happen first for that to happen. Right. And that's no different here. So... <laughs> Thank you guys for listening. If you have any lab reports or episode suggestions to send in, please send that to lucidlabpodcast at gmail.com. And we are on social media, not doing a great job representing yet, but <laughs> we are on TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram at lucidlabpodcast, all one word. And thank you for bringing this story, Jessica. I know you've put a lot of time into researching this and it's not a happy-go-lucky. I always end up with these ones. What's wrong with me? I've never heard this story. So Neither I'm like I. enthralled. I'm just sitting here like, oh my God, oh my God. It reminds me a lot of Fred and Rose. But without the sex. But at least it doesn't have all the sex part. Yeah. But in a way that almost makes it even crazier to me because there's not a sexual urge something driving that's underneath them. it. Yeah. This is just purely Torture. she wants to control and mm -hmm. hurt people she wants to inflict pain she's just a monstrous <laughs> a monstrous monstrous all righty guys please come back next week we'll see you for more details in the shelly no tech story shelly and dave no tech because dave's gonna get more involved definitely shelly can't write him off yep and it makes me think twice if anyone ever offers me a free place to stay <laughs> oh fuck that i don't believe that <laughs> only Nothing. trust your mom <laughs> Not this mom, but your mom. Yeah, not that mom. <laughs> Nothing in life is free, for sure. In the meantime, until we see you again, stay lucid. Bye. Adios. Oh. <laughs>